uh, in a typical scene of multitasking, which for me is procrastinating one thing by working on another at the same time, I was drafting this presentation while prepping for a class and teaching, and in an unexpected moment of clarity, the two came together uh, in this passage. Okay, there we go. Um, which is from Walt Whitman's uh, Backward Glance or Traveled Roads, first published in 1888. My book and I, what a period we presume to span, those 30 years from 1850 to 80, and America in them. Proud, proud indeed may we be if we have called enough of that period in its own spirit to worthily waft a few breaths of it to the future, exclamation point. The line my book and I really caught my attention. I couldn't get over the question, how would we have to revise this line if Whitman were speaking it today? Or think about a student in one of our classes. Would it be my blog and I, or my e-portfolio and I? Or this one sounds really bad to me, my Facebook and I? <laughs> Whitman's passage makes me wonder about issues like digital longevity, preservation, and any medium's capacity to sort of keep history bearing forward. But mostly I'm struck by the way the passage expresses such a complete identification of a writer with his text as a living, breathing, independent, at times gnarly and surprising thing. The book is not the vehicle, but rather it's the companion, sitting in the passenger seat, sometimes taking a turn to drive now and then. Moreover, the passage makes me wonder and worry about the state of composing in and for digital media. If Whitman had grown up with a Commodore 64 instead of typesetting in ink, he surely would have been at the center of trends and creative practice in new media. Whitman self-published and literally produced his books, maintaining involvement with them from start to finish. His conception of the composing process is material through and through. In rescripting Walt Whitman, Ed Folsom and Kenneth Price capture this claim in precise terms. They write, ideas, Whitman's poems insist, pass from one person to another, not in some ethereal process, but through the bodies of text, through the muscular operations of tongues and hands and eyes, through the material objects of books. This thoroughly materialist approach to writing fits Catherine Hale's criteria for media-specific literary practice. If we take into account the broader scope of Whitman's lifelong writing project, what Folsom and Price call, quote, an extraordinary conflation of book and identity, Hale's term techno-text seems apt, composer, composing medium, and composition a dynamically interacting whole. But what would it take for Whitman to achieve that same techno-textual conflation in digital media, that idea of the book and I. If he had replaced that capital B book with some digital um, substrate, it would take knowing a markup language and maybe one or two programming language, languages, and or it would take a familiarity with a software platform and an operating system to run it. As I've recently tried to update my operating system only to discover that Snow Leopard is now totally passe, so now I have to have a new operating system to, for example, update my Zotero. Um, so yeah, that was kind of disappointing for me. And or the night before my preliminary exams, mind you. So all my notes are in Zotero. And or it might also take a devotion to staying up to date with changing web standards and new mobile devices, right? So like one thing breaks in CSS and then it gets fixed in Firefox, but then it's also broken in Internet Explorer, but you don't have Internet Explorer because you have a Mac, so then you have to fight with that. So I can envision Whitman being quite fond of commenting his code. He would mark up his HTML body as if it were his own. Yet, and imagine he continuously revised and updated the same text for 30 years as he did with Leaves of Grass. It would take an incredible amount of technical skill, support, and ambition. For Whitman, or here I could even say, students in any writing intensive class, getting the digital material apparatus to embody the process of its own creation is difficult. It's hard work made even harder, not only by institutions and programs that aren't structured to afford the time or resources to teach encoding in depth, but also, I would argue, a trend in digital culture towards preferring a smooth user experience, even if that means making the back-end functionality hostile to users who want to understand how it works. The first factor is important, but so is the second. The receding presence of materiality, specifically in web applications that see users as consumers, so not only Amazon, but also Facebook, 
is largely a result of anti-material sentiment intertwined with devices that are explicitly designed and marketed to not be noticed. I take the term anti-materiality from the political philosopher Jane Bennett, who argues convincingly that the separation of inert and passive object from purposeful active human subject is neither ethical nor accurate. Um, she champions a vitality intrinsic to matter itself. For the vital materialist, anti-materialism is not simply an ignorance of matter, but an accelerated sweeping aside or an aggressive disposal of matter and its messiness. So she actually talks about anti-materialism in the context of consumer culture. It's hard to discern, much less acknowledge, the material dignity of the thing when your thoughts are scrambled by the miles of shelving in a superstore. Too much stuff in too quick succession equals the fast drive from object to trash. Through the lens of what she calls thing power, objects or debris, so objects for her equals stuff to ignore or even fear, become lively things, stuff that commands attention. While Bennett's subject matter is metal crystals, fatty acids, and electrical power grids, it's easy to see how the concept of anti-materialism can translate to digital culture. So just think of the app store, where for 99 cents or for nothing, you can get this little device that just does exactly what it should do, and nothing more and nothing less. And if you don't like the little app that you just downloaded, you can leave it there, or you can just ditch it off your device and just find another one, because there's a really big selection out there. So you don't need to settle for the little thing that might be half broken. Um, so for a number of years, I've gotten in the habit of just sort of jotting down um, striking quotes from those hor you know, insane TV commercials trying to market like cell phones and other tech stuff, just like the crazy marketing angles they take. So this one in 2008 really stood out to me. It's for an iPhone. Um, the slogan that they used in the commercial was iPhone, colon, solving life's dilemmas one app at a time. So this appification of computers, which is the process of turning a, cl a complex and error-prone technology into a Swiss army knife, is a marketing sensibility that sells ready-made fixes for problems, trumpets ease over struggle, and speeds along the recession of digital materiality in the process. Ease and forgettability are somewhat paradoxically the clearest beacons of complication. Latour is my touchstone for this point, especially in the narrative, um, I believe it's in Pandora's Hope, when the automatic door closer breaks in February, and someone has to put a note on the door just to remind people that the door closer is on strike, so please, for gosh sakes, close the door because it's cold outside. Um, so at this point, the door closer comes into view. As Gentry Sayers paraphrases the general argument of Latour, um, quote, with imperceptibility comes the naturalization of ideologies where only input and output matter. So, end quote, imperceptibility, which often qualifies as ease in our interfaces, is, um, is an enemy of creative practice and pedagogy. Ease conceals opportunities for intervention and resistance. Such opportunities are actually easier, easier to identify when a particular medium has rough edges and takes something other than ease of use as its primary goal. In this way, then, we might think of rough media as actually being more teachable than easy, squeaky clean, well-functioning media. Contours, bugs, and surprises yield a deeper and less hierarchical critical engagement than we might otherwise discover in things that just work. So thinking with thing power helps us remember that all of our writing technologies have a little self-aware Roomba in them. Let me put this another way, and this might be stating the obvious. It's just easier to see the materiality of paper. And I don't like that I'm saying that, but I really just want to say that. Not just to see the materiality of paper, but to experience, to smell it, stain it, live through it. If you've ever gotten a deep paper cut, that slice is given, but a tiny red measure of you is also received by the paper. Think of your oldest book, the book you took with you on your semester abroad, the book you packed and unpacked with each new apartment lease, the book you've repaired or let fall apart. I had a rubber band book for a while, but then the rubber band broke, so now it's all, no one knows what parts of the book go where. Um, so I know this is starting to sound nostalgic, and I tend to be a nostalgic person, but I want to insist that this is more than nostalgia. It's a radical identification of the agency of writing materials, and it's the claim that Whitman's degree of identification with a text is simply harder to achieve in code than it is with script. Because most users, quote, will simply not have entree to the mechanisms governing their interactions with electronic information, end quote, comes from Matthew Kirschenbaum, 
the access point for the functionality of paper is just a much bigger target than it is for computers. It wasn't always that way. Prior to the 1970s, the general public would have almost immediately associated computers or electronic brains with heaving, noisy, hot physical matter. The word digital went through a gradual process of becoming tied to a sense of fluidity and ease more than to a sense of roughness and presence. To make this point, I'll briefly kind of trace how digital gets used in American journalism starting uh, sort of in the, around the 1920s. So of course, the Latin etymology of digital is finger, so journalists use it for piano concerts, the pianist's digital infelicities. Um, so this, 19, this is an article from 1937. Um, it shows a feature, a, features a photo of a bridal party guest. So this is an article covering just any old daily, a day in the life of a bridal party guest. Um, and it shows one of the guests giving digital attention to her coiffure. Um, but in the 1940s, the military began publicly revealing bits and pieces of the computing technology it used during World War II. And computing pioneers emerged from behind the scenes. Um, and we sort of got to see what, a little bit of what was happening. Um, so at this point, digital was beginning to take root in the public imaginary as binary data fast, efficient, easier than adding machines and paper. Yet, importantly, it was still tough to ignore the materiality of computing, right? In a 1946 article, the ENIAC, which is the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, a tremendously large device that occupied an entire room, was depicted alongside the human programmers or attendants adjusting wires and controls. So the article reports on speed right alongside brooding complexity and architectural creature-like features. And this is a quote from the article that I really love. The ENIAC has some 40 panels, nine feet high, which bristle with control and indicating material. I just love that line. However, as computers got smaller and as the field of interface design established itself as a profession, the principle of immateriality as a user experience emerged. Most historians locate the beginning of this emergence in the mid-1960s when the focus of computer scientists expanded from military applications to encompass, quote, affordable interactive computing, end quote. That's from Janet Abadi's uh, History of the Internet. In the 1950s, quote, the interactive style of computing made possible by random access disk memory would force IBM, as well as the rest of the computer industry, to redefine itself. And that's a quote from Ceruzzi. In the mid-60s, interactive computing meant time sharing, the technique of distributing a single computer's processing power across multiple users. So time sharing was more efficient than batch processing, which required paper punch cards and magnetic tape, and which distanced programmers from the actual computer. According to Abadi, time sharing was seen by its proponents as the innovation that would liberate computers from their punch cards and allow direct and easy interaction with the machine. Donald Davies' notion of a national packet switching network in the UK furthered the goal of interactivity and user friendliness. Davies wanted his network to appeal to business workers and recreational users, and he was, quote, one of many researchers who hoped to improve the user friendliness of computers, end quote, and that comes from Abati. This meant that communication to be easy and as immediate as possible had to allow, quote, the user to be able to ignore the complexities end quote, of the computer's operation, and that's from Davies in 1966. The operating system further, quote, removed the inscriptive act from the direct oversight of the human user, screening it first by the command line and then by a graphical user interface, according to Kirschenbaum. As he and other historically-minded media scholars have illustrated, the deliberate engineering of immateriality resulted in the user growing apart from operations, often called black boxing of functionality. What we now refer to as digital culture bears few meaningful reminders of the paper, wood, tangles of wires, quote, 18,000 vacuum tubes and 30 tons, which comes from the article in the ENIAC, which all were once unforgettably, irrepressibly, irrepressibly, irrepressibly and even impressively in the picture. Should have rethought those words. While paper insists on its materiality and it's not good at hiding its age or covering over mistreatment, most modern digital applications are generally really good at the opposite. They are designed so that the user doesn't think about materiality. 
Indeed, proprietary software makes it difficult or impossible to feel close to the code. Facebook's code is intentionally distancing. If you've ever tried to follow the class names of Facebook, it's just a, combina a, a combination of 20 to 30 characters that make no sense to outsiders. Um, networked digital applications are also designed to be resilient and self-healing. So if, if you've ever you know, had a Windows machine that's constantly releasing patches, that self-patching process, in saying that we can more readily approach the materiality of paper than we can the materiality of digital composition, that's not to say that paper is more natural or more human. In the first edition of Leaves of Grass, in fact, we find a sentiment that's utterly opposed to the conflation of book and identity, which Folsom and Price describe as central. Um, Whitman writes, I was chilled with the cold types and cylinder and wet paper between us. I pass so poorly with paper and types. I must pass with the contact of bodies. These lines stay put more or less unaltered through four revisions of what would eventually become the poem, A Song for Occupations. And he finally took them out in 1881. So these lines stayed through a number of different reiterations. Um, and they betray a desire for warmth and immediate nearness that could somehow pierce the cold interface. The paper book as a support for writing is indeed a contrivance, a screen, quote, a little machine for two hands to use Derrida's great phrase. Whitman's authorial persona in these lines acknowledges that. But somehow with time and age, perhaps things changed for him. Plainly, this is not the same attitude that we get in that first quote from 1888, where he is traveling with his book. The Whitman shilled by the mediating presence of cylinder and wet paper is a Whitman who's stumbling over friction in the means. In her MLA address last year, Bethany Novisky made a distinction between fr friction in the means and friction in the materials. Friction in the means is disenfranchising resistance, unhealthily located in a tool set. Friction in the materials, in contrast, is positive resistance, the kind that makes art. Those who encounter friction in the means are mere users. Those who encounter friction in the materials have an active, generative capacity to get their hands dirty. For Novisky, these two types of resistance translate to two potential futures for the digital humanities. One, DH as a generative research activity in its own right, and two, commodity tool use for the classroom. What does this latter future look like? Last October, a DMCA violation notice from Pearson over a single piece of content turned into the equivalent of a kill switch for the Edge of Logs network. After receiving Pearson's takedown notice, Web hosting firm Server Beach, which hosts not only Edge Blogs but also some content for WordPress, completely pulled the plugs on the entire Edge Blogs network. Clearly, when 1.45 million blogs become 404 error pages, that's friction in the means. The source of resistance for Edge Blogs employees and users was literally inaccessible. Edge Blogs is based in Australia, so it was not only like across an ocean, but it was also like many time zones apart. So this was 3 a.m. for Edge Blogs and during the day for Server Beach. Um, so, this is a quote from intellectual property attorney Evan Brown. It's pretty hard to believe that a hosting provider would take an entire network offline over one piece of content, end quote. It might be hard to believe, but it's also hard to actually understand, unless you're familiar with copyright law, web server caches, database lookup, the difficulty of human communication via email, and other factors that probably have nothing to do with the post you are writing on your Edge of Logs course site, which has just completely disappeared. So yes, it can help to learn to program, it can help to roll your own website, it can help to have your own server. All these things are full of DIY goodness. But it's also important to acknowledge and actively foster learning situations that nurture risk taking and are hostile to forgetfulness and uncritical tool use. Because you never DI 100% why. If we take seriously the tenets of think power, Getting closer to materiality is not about reclaiming control and enforcing one's subjectivity in the midst of technological struggle. Rather, quote, the ethical aim becomes to distribute value more generously, that's from Bennett, and to acknowledge the agency inherent in our so-called tools. Different from resistance in the materials and resistance in the means, what Bennett calls thing powers of resistance, bypass the user-maker divide and re human and non-human actors in a network of relations, which Erica touched on nicely. The resistance of thing power shines a certain slant of light on digital materiality, and the lesson I learn is that whether we assume a role of maker or user, whether we program or are programmed, there's no escaping 
the invasion of various actants that we cannot control nor predict. To wrap up, I want to come back to that quote we started with, the um, wet cylinder quote. Why did, I'm just, I was just asking myself, why did he take these lines out in 1881? Um, Although I don't claim to be a Whitman scholar and I haven't poured over his manuscripts, I can speculate that as his text endured and accrued a life of its own over the drafts and decades and piling up of paper, um, Whitman began to acknowledge contact not just between writers and readers, but also between writers and their materials or their texts. I believe the stumbling block of means, that is the wet paper, which is akin to the flawed interface or rough user experience, became an allowance or a portal for agency in the materials for women. What he experienced is not a transfer of control or conversion from passive tool user to capable artisan, as Nowitzki says. The removal of these lines doesn't signify, I don't think, his discover of a maker's agency or a reclamation of control, because Whitman had always been a maker. Rather, what I see is a concession. Near the end of his life, a coming to terms with the lively agency present in his writing materials. The question, quote, how do we extricate, oh no, that's not a quote because I wrote it, I was just using quote marks. So if we ask ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> if we ask ourselves a question, you know, faced with the edge of log situation, how do, we, how do we get ourselves out of this situation? How do we get back control from edge of logs? How do we um, not be commodity tool, use, tool users? Like how do we take a stand against this commodity tool use? That quickly becomes, how do we humanize ourselves in the face of cold types and wet paper? Yet both questions make little sense in a world where humans are humans because they interact with things. I'm not saying be suspicious of easy interfaces. I'm saying be captivated by them. In the way that a child's first inclination upon receiving a multi-part toy for Christmas is to take it apart. At least that was the first thing I did. My grandmother hated it. Um, I'm saying just respond with surprise, engagement, and a touch of abandon. Thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, your paper. It's really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering how much of, um, and you touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering how much of what uh, you're seeing is this kind of difference, not difference, between what Whitman was experiencing and how we experience Whitman and what we experience with digital interfaces today is a problem of kind of historical situatedness. And how do we get around that as teachers and scholars who work with these machines? Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to work out sort of like a pedagogical framework or just like, I guess, kind of a heuristic of like what this would mean like in a, in a pragmatic situation. But I haven't quite gotten there yet. I mean, because it is hard when you're trying to teach content alongside aware, you know, critical awareness. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's definitely historical and I think it's probably also like just not... You know, like, for example, a lot of my students just don't have any idea how the internet works, and that seems to me to be a bit of a problem, and I, I just don't think that, you know, I learned a lot just from looking at the brief history of the digital, and I, unless you're actively seeking that out, there's no way to, like, I don't think it's, it's hard to access that history, I think. Yeah, but I don't know, that's a great question. So, you mentioned Windows machines and patches. <laughs> so what do you make of right, the digital interfaces that don't work very well, right, and, and break or apps that crash constantly? Right. What do you mean? What do I? What I, do I think of them as an individual, or what? Do, what would I like? How do they fit into the system that you just described, where paper is rough, right, and apps and digital technology can seem smooth, seem right. really easy. Well, I like them. I mean, I like glitches. Like, I would say we need more of them. Like, that's why I've really tried to focus on my work on better understanding error and its relationship to an active-passive divide and just trying to really get around that active-passive because whenever an error makes someone feel passive, it also activates parts in that person but also parts in a network relation. So I'm really trying to understand like how I can think about error as being a productive force, but also you know acknowledging that when people need to do a task and they need to do it in 30 seconds, no one wants like Expedia to crash or whatever. So 
yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying to work it out. And I think just using examples helps a lot. Like, so I'm just trying to collect examples of erroring situations or crashing. Um, so I know people older than me who lament the lack of understanding people have of the cars they drive these days, mm -hmm. right? Um, and cars were rough, and now they're not. And you get away with all sorts of things with cars that you couldn't get away with in the old days. Um, so if I argued, wow, well, we ought to go back to rough cars and stuff, you know, that would seem like a ridiculous mm -hmm. argument, right? Um, yeah. So, so why isn't this one equally ridiculous from that perspective? Because I see a fundamental difference between all other kinds of tools and writing technologies. Like for me, I want to say writing technologies are special things. Um, because of this way that we can extend our identity and live through a writing technology that's not sort of possible in like people, methods of transportation. I mean people, the, the whole identity wrapped up in cars, extending our identity and living through that, that, I can say all the same things about cars, right? right? And I'm also looking at sort of situations of borders and arguing something similar, right, in the way that a person can actually compose parts of his or her life through a horde um, or like live through that horde. So I think that might be maybe perhaps a better way for me to think about that. A but horde, H-O-A-R-D. Yeah, H -O -R -D like a pile of stuff, yeah. Right. Uh, but I think another difference, I don't know if maybe you'll buy this People difference. Like car stuff. Right, I don't know if maybe you'll buy this difference. It's just the fact that it's on a network and that there are all these things going on in the cars code. on a road network, right? But think about, think about like a, just an average like piece of little JavaScript. Like the average user would have no idea what that little piece of JavaScript is doing and how much data it's collecting or like an inter a browser cookie. Think a about a Spark. The average user has no idea. What but I still is. argue that there's part of that user's identity that a corporation is taking in a way that's not happening with a car. Like I think networked media are fundamentally different from like methods of transportation. Well, I understand that's what you're asserting, but I'm trying to understand the basis for that assertion. I guess I just feel like it's problematic that users don't understand that they're being tracked online or that there's all these things going on with a digital network that they're not even aware of. Or just how, it's so hard to just even explain what a browser cookie is. That to me seems to be a problem. Like, it should be easier to understand that when we go online, like how, how are our passwords saved? Like, it's, it seems to me so much more complicated than transportation. So, so one more thing, I mean, the average car driver doesn't understand how their driving is contributing to global warming, right? It should be so much more transparent. I mean, it seems to me <laughs> I can say all of these things. About right, but we're actually concerned with making it more transparent, right? Like, we actually want to understand, like, there's actually a desire to understand, like, Some how Some bits of it we want to make transparent and others we don't. Yeah, but I think in general, I mean, I think with Obama, like, certainly, like, there's a desire to, like, have more, you know, hybrid cars and more clean. Like, there's, you know, and we'll see commercials with gas stations, and we'll see the electric car driving up, and it's a positive thing, right? But, like, you would never see a, com a commercial for, like, a Windows tablet where we understand, like, do you know, I don't know, it just yeah. seems to me a fun, but you're right, and I appreciate the question, and I'm going to have to think more, because I completely understand this viewpoint, and I'm really trying to think about how to make it seems special. Yeah, I think we're talking about it. I appreciate what I'm trying to do. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, no, I just had a question about um, about uh, capitalism and uh, durability, uh, which I think is something that gets at rough in the Also, I'm just thinking about the ships, like how would you think about uh, built-in obsolescence, which is something that has to do with the cars and, and right. has to do with operating systems and stuff like that. As uh, I'm thinking about Jonathan Stern, the uh, historian of technology, who wrote, you know, if, if it weren't for capitalism, and it would be possible to make durability smart. You know, durability was profitable for smart if it was actually an idea that could sustain people, that we'd actually have dur durable uh, technology. And that right. would go for cars, for like, music, for writing, everything. Right. So, so how do you see the sh some shifts in, uh, in what's going on with, with the economy and uh, um, it, ha it having to do with the shifts, of, like the period of Whitman that you're looking at and the, the digital um, oh, yeah. becoming smooth and... Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not 100% sure how to latch on to that question, but I guess one thing I can say is that it does sort of seem to me, as far as obsolescence, like it is very difficult to keep a web application 
like from becoming obsolete. Like it takes a lot of effort to keep it updated. Um, and I think obviously in a way that like the book would, you know, it's, you know, they're not, I mean, obviously we can look at examples of art books that actually, van like the ink will vanish or whatever, but aside from like, I think special experimental cases with books, um, you know, you have the object and the object doesn't need to have an update, but I'm not sure how that relates to um, to issues of economy and capital, capital though. Um, but I'll have to read more. I have it registered. I think that the fact that that um, that even making, for instance, making a book that would be a digital, like even digital humanities publishing, uh, presses worry about yeah. how you know is that going to even be able to last? You know, mm -hmm. um, so like if I make a digital humanities um, project, how long will it last? People, how long will people be able to see it? Where if I do. You know, so I think, I but have. if the technology um, was in, was produced in an economy where durability could be something desired, you know, that was possible, that was considered smart, because you could make things that would last. Yeah, so then, then it would be more appealing. Yeah. Be migrating, like there would be more interest in making things migratable, and people having the, the, uh, the knowledge to be able to, to work creatively with that. Right. Yeah, that's a great thought. In the interest of time, I'm going to yep. move on to Derek, but thanks yep. for that. Derek.